Hi, welcome once again to our YouTube channel. Thanks for subscribing to our channel. Really appreciate you. And in this particular series, we shall be treating past questions from the Jam collection. So we'll be looking at a series of questions that have been asked by Jam over the years, and we'll be giving well detailed explanations to all of the questions as we come across them. I will implore you to try as much as possible to pay keen attention to all of the explanations that will be given in tackling all of the questions. I wish you success in your exam and please don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thank you very much. Hi, welcome once again to our JAM series. Right now, I want to take questions from the JAM Biology 2023 questions. So that is where we're going to start from. So we're taking questions from the 2023 JAM Biology. So let us dive straight into our questions. Let's see what our questions look like. All right, these are the sets of questions that we have. Number one question that says, which of the following is the most inclusive level of classification in the linear system? That is what our question one is saying. And the options we have there, we have kingdom, domain, class, and then phylum. When we look at the, the levels of classification, basically these are the things that we have. We have uh, seven classifications, and it starts from the kingdom number one, we have the kingdom and then the next one we have the phylum or division number three we have the class number four we have the order number five we have the family Number six, we have the genus. And then the seventh one, we have the species. So when we look at these levels of classification, the one that encompasses all of them happens to be the kingdom. Because in the kingdom, we have basically five kingdoms. If I may put them here, we have five kingdoms. The first one is Kingdom Monera. The second one is Kingdom Protista. The third one is Kingdom Fungi. We have the fourth one to be Kingdom Plantae. And the last one there is Kingdom Animalia. So every organism that you might want to think of must fall under any of these five kingdoms. So it is the kingdom that encompasses all of them. And so that is the answer to the question that we have there for question one, which is talking about the most inclusive level of classification. So our answer is option A, which is kingdom. So number one, option A. So let's move to question two. Which of the following is a method of asexual reproduction in plants? A, pollination. B, vegetative propagation. C, seed dispersal. And then D, we have fertilization. Right now, the answer to this particular question is talking about vegetative propagation. Now, in plants, we have basically the vegetative propagation to be, we have so many types of reproduction, generally. Reproduction is the bringing to life of young ones. That is basically what reproduction talks about. So we have two types now. The types of reproduction. We have the first one to be asexual reproduction, which talks about reproduction involving just one parent. Reproduction. It involves one parent. Under asexual here now is where we now have the different examples. Talking about budding, we have budding, we have binary fission, we have binary fission, we have grafting, we have layering, we have layering, we have E, we have vegetative propagation and we have two types of vegetative propagation, vegetative propagation. They are of two types. We have the natural, it's divided into two, 
we have the natural vegetative propagation and we have the artificial vegetative propagation so basically it is under this part here that we have plants carrying out their reproduction that is the answer to our question but before we go to that let me quickly tell us the second type of of reproduction and that is talking about the we have a second type here number two types of reproduction now types of reproduction we said the first one was asexual then the second one is called the sexual reproduction this one here involves two parents involves two parents and the types that we have there we have the first one to be called conjugation conjugation and then the second one is called the fusion of gametes so those are the two types of reproduction asexual which involves one parent and then sexual which involves two parents and under the sexual reproduction we have two types as well the conjugation and the fusion of gametes so the answer to our question like we can see there is option b which is vegetative propagation it is the type of asexual reproduction that occurs in plants it is not pollination it is not seed dormancy and it is not fertilization it is vegetative propagation that is option b and then we move to question three which of the following is the primary organ involved in gaseous exchange during respiration in humans diaphragm bronchi lungs trachea now the major organ the primary organ that involves in gaseous exchange is the lungs I'll give you another option that we have here they partake in the actions that the lung oversees the actions that the lung oversees talking about the bronchi the trachea or the movement of the diaphragm is as a result of what the lung does which is actually respiration so that is the answer to this particular question here so that is option c option c is our answer to question three and then question four which of the following statements about the heart is true a the heart is responsible for the production of red blood cells b the heart pumps oxygenated blood to the lungs c the heart receives blood from the kidneys and filters waste products d the heart is a muscular organ that contracts to circulate blood throughout the body now when we look at this particular question here talking about the function of the heart the heart is a major organ a major organ in the body of animals it is a muscular organ that helps to pump blood to pump blood in order to circulate nutrients waste waste materials hormones and several other several other materials across the body now it does this by continuous contraction and relaxation the heart contracts and relaxes so we call it the beating of the heart so that is the, the redemical movement of the heart when it contracts because it is muscular so it compresses and it expands so that is what the heart does so doing this it pumps blood and the blood which is rich in so many things including oxygen gaseous materials now nutrient waste products hormones and the rest of those it helps to circulate them throughout the body to deficient organs of the body and then it takes waste material from these organs of the body back to the heart so that is the function of the heart so let us see what the statements here are saying that the heart is responsible for production of red blood cell no 
the heart does not produce red blood cells. Red blood cells are produced in the red bone marrows of the longest bone in the body, which is the femur. And then option B there says that the heart pumps oxygenated blood to the lungs. No, the type of blood that goes from the heart to the lungs is called deoxygenated blood. And that is during the pulmonary circulation because we have two types of circulation. We have the pulmonary circulation and the systemic circulation. So the type of blood that the heart pumps to the lungs is deoxygenated blood. And that is taken to the lungs. Now the third option there says the heart receives blood from the kidney and filters waste product. Well, the heart receives blood from the kidney and it filters waste product. It is the function of the kidney to filter the waste product, not the function of the heart. The kidney does the filtration and it sends the blood to the heart, particularly when it is carrying waste materials. It takes the waste material to the heart so that the heart can help to eliminate it. The kidney does the, the filtration. It is not the heart that does the filtration. The kidney does the filtration. So the heart just takes the blood to, to the kidney and then the kidney does the filtration to send out whatever waste material that is in the, in the blood. The fourth option there says, the heart is a muscular organ that contracts to circulate blood throughout the body. Yes, that is the answer that you are looking out for. The heart is a muscular organ and it helps to circulate blood throughout the body. So that is the answer to our question for number four, option D. So we move to question five. Which of the following characteristics is typical of the phylum Arthropoda? A. Radial symmetry. B. Closed circulatory system. C endoskeleton made of bones and then d we have presence of segmented bodies when we look at the arthropods arthropods are a class of the animals now when we have the animal they all have different characteristics and one of the characteristics of the arthropods is what we want to talk about right now so the characteristic typical of the phylum arthropod is the presence of segmented body it's not that they have radially symmetry body because if you cut them through a particular plane of the body, you will not be having equal parts. And then they do not have closed circulatory system, nor is it that they have endoskeleton made of bones. Their endoskeleton are not of bones because they do not have that type of supporting tissue. So it is that they have the presence of the segmented body. That is what the answer to that particular question is. Arthropods have segmented bodies and arthropods include, we have the likes of the insects, the spiders, the crustaceans, the myrapoda. Myrapoda uh, involves two types of classes. We have, in the class, in the class of myrapoda, we have the chiplopoda and the diplopoda, where we have the centipede and the millipede. So, all of these organisms have their bodies divided into distinct segments and with jointed appendages. So, that is the answer to question 5 there. Option D is the answer to question Five. Question six now. Which process in the nutrient cycle converts atmospheric nitrogen into a form that plants can utilize? A. Denitrification. B. Nitrogen fixation. C. Ammonification. And D. Nitrification. Those are the options that you have there. Now, the answer to our question there is definitely nitrogen fixation. It is not denitrification, it is not ammonification, and it is not nitrification. It is nitrogen fixation. Why? Nitrogen fixation Nitrogen fixation which is a process carried out by We have the nitrogen fixing bacteria responsible for this action carried out By the nitrogen fixing bacteria Is a process in the nutrient cycle, particularly in the nitrogen cycle. Nutrient cycle. The nitrogen, because we have so many types of nutrient cycle. We have water cycle, we have carbon cycle, oxygen cycle. So this particular one that we're talking about is the nitrogen cycle. So it is a process in the nutrient cycle or nitrogen cycle that converts atmospheric nitrogen that helps to convert atmospheric nitrogen it converts atmospheric nitrogen 
into a form that plants can utilize into a usable form a usable form of nitrogen that plants can utilize so basically that is what we're talking about the types of nitrogen or nitrogenous compound that that is generated here we have ammonia or some other related compounds so those are the types of nitrogen compounds that is generated and that is utilized by the plants so that is basically the answer to our question there the nitrogen fixation that is option b and then we move to question seven most fishes do not sink in water because of the presence of roman numeral one swim bladder roman numeral two air bladder Roman numeral 3, air sacs, and Roman numeral 4, we have the air in spongy bones. So option A then says 1 and 3 are correct. Option B then says 1 and 2 are correct. Option C says 1, 2, 3, and 4 are correct. And option D then says 3 and 4 are correct. Now if we look at this particular question, we will find out that our correct answer is option B, which is talking about Roman numeral 1 and 2, meaning that the fish is possess swim bladders and the air bladder so what do they use these things for the fishes do not sink in water primarily because of these two organs that we have made mention of the swim bladder and air bladder now As structures that control the fish's buoyancy in water helps to control the fish buoyancy in water and thus prevents thus prevents them from sinking. So that is the major function of this substance. So they are responsible for keeping the fishes afloat in the water. So that is option B. Option B. So we move to question 8. A biome characterized by hot summer, warm winter, and treeless vegetation is A. Steep grassland B. Temperate desert C. Savanna grassland and D. Tropical desert. When we have such question, we need to look out for major keywords so what are the keywords that we have there let me identify them we have hot desert we have warm winter and then we have treeless vegetation those are the keywords that we have there hot summer warm winter and treeless vegetation so we need to look at these characteristics to be able to answer this question now the question there is looking for a biome biomes are environments with characteristic appearances with characteristic appearances so when we have a biome it is going to have uniform characteristic that is basically what that is telling us now if you look at our options there we have steep grassland temperate desert savanna grassland then tropical desert now it said it could have hot summer warm winter so the environment can be cold or hot. Summer here is talking about hot environments, and then the winter, which is supposed to be the cold season, is also temperately warm. And then the last clue that we have is the treeless vegetation. So that environment must have vegetation. That is very important. But what kind of vegetation are we expected to have in such environments? The kind of vegetation is going to be treeless that means there will be no trees but it will have vegetation so definitely it is going to be more of grasses treeless means that there will be no trees there so we'll be having grasses or let's say shrubs so such environment is going to be majorly grasses so we have the steep grassland we have the savanna grassland the deserts are environments that do not have vegetations at all so those are ruled out of our 
option so we have the savanna grassland and then the steep grassland now the savanna is basically found in environments that are majorly grassland and they are hot savannas are majorly close to the desert so they do not really have winter so the answer to our question here is going to be the steep grassland steep grasslands are regions with vast expanses of grasses and herbs but they are largely but they are largely devoid of trees and that is why they suit our answer so if you look at the the kind of environment the kind of characteristic that we have in this environment the climate there ranges from hot summers with particularly temperatures like the temperatures there it ranges from let's say 40 degrees celsius that is about 104 degree Fahrenheit we have that there and then the winters are relatively warm compared to other cold climates but still they experience temperatures below freezing these combinations of temperature and extreme absence of significance of trees covers the airline that describes or provides our answer to this particular question now that is why we are picking the steep grassland to be the answer to our question number eight there that is option A. And then we are moving straight to option 9 now. Which of the following describes the inheritance of traits from parents to offspring? A. Adaptation. B. Evolution. C. Natural selection. And D. Genetics. Now this particular question brings us to talk about the transfer of traits from parents to offspring. And that is basically genetics. Adaptation is talking about the ability of an organism to survive in an unfavorable environment. That is what adaptation is talking about. And then evolution discusses the series of changes that has taken place in organisms for millions of years for a very long period of time. And natural selection discusses the types of traits that are being picked randomly by embryos when fertilization takes place. But the way the organism gets to inherit what is being given or what is being uh, sent to it from the parent is what we refer to as genetics. Genetics. Genetics is the study, the study of genes. So these genes are genes are hereditary materials that are inherited by offsprings inherited by offsprings sent to them from their parents so they inherit the, these genes from their parents and that is what the answer to our question there is in number nine there is genetics which is option d and then Number 10. Which of the following options correctly identifies excretory organs in animals? A. Stomach, intestine, and bladder. B. Lungs, kidney, and skin. C. Brain, spinal cord, and nerves. And D. Heart, liver, and spleen. When we look at the, the question, they're talking about excretory organs. So, which of these options here all are excretory organs? The stomach is definitely not an excretory organ because the stomach is part of the digestive system. So also is the intestine. They make up the digestive system. It is in the stomach that we have the action of the HCL in the gastric juice acting upon the food. And then we have the intestine, the small intestine, where uh, other pancreatic enzymes and the, uh, the intestinal enzymes act on the food. So it is more of digestive than excretory. So... That is not our answer. Let's move straight to the option C. Brain is not 
and excretory organelles. So also is the spinal cord. The brain, the spinal cord, and the nerves, they form the nervous system. They make up the nervous system. Specifically, okay, the brain and the spinal cord make up the central nervous system. Well, we have nerves in the peripheral as well. The heart, the liver, and the spleen, they are not all. The heart, for example, is, is in the circulatory system and not excretory system. So, the set of organs here that make up the excretory organs, they are the lungs, the kidney, and the skin. The lungs help to eliminate gases like the carbon dioxide in animals. The kidney helps to eliminate waste metabolites, urea, and the rest of those. And then the skin helps to eliminate water and then salts that are not needed in the body. So those are the organs that make or take part in the excretory system. So that is option B. So we'll move straight to question 11 now. Which processes are involved in nutrient cycling in a functioning ecosystem? A. Erosion, weathering and sedimentation. B. Decomposition, evaporation and precipitation. C. Nitrogen fixation, denitrification, and ammonification. And then D, we have respiration, photosynthesis, and re transpiration. Now, we made mention of nutrient cycling some questions back. And here, we're also talking about the processes involved in nutrient cycling again. And major option that we have here is going to be option C, talking about nitrogen fixation, denitrification, and ammonification. All of these processes here are taking place in the nutrient cycling or particularly talking about the nitrogen cycle that is where we have all of this uh all, the, all of these processes taking place now when we look at it the processes involved in nutrient cycling in a functioning ecosystem include the nitrogen fixation these processes all take part in the nitrogen cycle which is crucial aspect of the nutrient cycling so that is the answer to our question option c is the answer to question 11 and then we move to question 12 which of the following eye defects is caused by the inability of the eye to focus light on the retina a we have the glaucoma myopia c we have cataracts and d astigmatism when we look at the question there it's talking about inability of the eye to focus its light on the retina when the light is not focused on the retina, the vision will be blurry, the vision will not be clear. So which of these eye defects? Is it glaucoma or is it myopia or is it cataract or is it astigmatism? The actual answer to that question is myopia. All other ones that like the glaucoma, the cataract, astigmatism, they are all eye defects. Example, if we talk about the glaucoma, is a group of eye defects that affects the optic nerves at the back of the eye. That is basically what the glaucoma is. Cataract on its own, cataract is the clouding of the clear lens of the eye. The clouding of the clear lens of the eye. And we have astigmatism, astigmatism to be, we have it to be the imperfection in the curvatures of the eye. imperfection in the curvatures of the eye when the eye is not properly curved that is what results to astigmatism and so it also causes blurry vision so the actual one that we're talking about is the myopia myopia or short-sightedness Myopia or short sightedness. This is when the eye falls, the eye points its light before the retina or the eye falls.
focuses its, its light before the retina so the the light ray doesn't get onto the retina and so it causes short sightedness where the person will be able to see objects at close distance or short distances while the person will not be able to see objects that are far away and this this particular process can be corrected it can be corrected using it is corrected using concave lens you correct it using the concave lens another one is the hypermetropia now hypermetropia which is long sightedness in this particular in this particular one the lens does not get the light onto the retina because the light is focused after or behind the retina so the person is will be the person will be able to see objects that are at long distance further away from the person but the person will not be able to see subject objects that are close to him or her so such can be corrected using the convex we correct this using the convex lens so the answer to our question there is the myopia which is option b then we have question 13 now. which of the following is the correct classification of carbohydrates lipids phytonutrients macronutrients and d micronutrients when we look at carbohydrates carbohydrates are food substances that are needed in the body extensively because they are needed in large quantity they are needed in large amount and so we refer to them as macronutrients. Carbohydrates are correctly classified as macronutrients because they are nutrients that are required in the body relatively in large amount and they include carbohydrates, proteins and so other, other macronutrients that we're talking about, we have proteins and fat and oils. So 13 day carbohydrates is a classification of the macronutrients, option C. So question 14 now. Which organs are part of the alimentary canal in the human digestive system? Now, previously here we talked about excretory organs. Here we are talking about digestive system. So what are the organs that take part in digestion? Option A, we have salivary glands, tongue, pharynx. Option B, we have large intestine, appendix, rectum. Option C, we have stomach, liver, and gallbladder. And option D, we have esophagus, pancreas, and the small intestine. If I were to answer that question, I would say our answer is option D. Salivary gland, yes, might take part in digestion. So also the tongue, but not the pharynx. And then we have the large intestine that doesn't take part in digestion. And then the appendix, it doesn't. The liver also does not take part in digestion. But when we look at option D, the esophagus helps to pass the food from the mouth into the stomach. So it is a passageway for that is where we have peristalsis taking place in the esophagus. And then we have the pancreas which is responsible for producing digestive enzymes like the insulin and the glucagon. The small intestine is where we now have the production of the digestive enzymes or the digestive substances where we have the amylases, the tripases and the lipases. So option D is our answer. And then question 15. Which of the following statements? about viruses is true a viruses can reproduce outside a host cell that is absolutely wrong it is not possible because viruses need to survive in a host to actually reproduce b viruses require a host cell to replicate that is absolutely uh let's let's see other options viruses require okay viruses possess a cellular structure and then option d there says viruses are living organisms now if you look at that particular answer the, the answer there is uh, option b which is viruses require a host cell to replicate yes if the virus is not in a living host the virus cannot be uh, alive cannot function cannot be uh, carrying out the real the characteristics of an organism that it should carry because it needs to survive in a living host so without the virus being in a living host it cannot function so it cannot replicate so that is the statement that is absolutely true about the virus that is option b option b then we move to question 16 what is the definition of population ecology a the study of interactions between organisms and 
their physical environment, b the study of, ev of evolutionary processes and their effects on population, c the study of interactions between different populations in an ecosystem, and d we have the study of the of the distribution and abundance of individuals within a species. Looking at this now, talking about ecology and population. First, what is ecology? Ecology is the study of organisms in their non-living environment. So we see re ecology as the relationship relationship between biotic and abiotic components so biotic components include plants and animals we have them here to be plants and then animals and then the abiotic component everything that is found in the environment so the relationship between the plants and animals and their environment is basically what we refer to as ecology. But that is not what our question is asking us. It's asking us for the population ecology. So the answer to this question is absolutely option D, which is talking about the study of the distribution and abundance of individuals within a species. That is the answer to our question there. So let us see. When we look at that particular question there, Population ecology helps to focus, helps to focus on factors that influence the size so this is now where the population comes in it influences the size and the dynamics and dynamics of population and these factors we have them including we have the factors including birth rates Uh, death rates that is another factor we have uh, migration which is divided into two we have emigration and immigration so all of these are factors that can actually uh, promote or hinder the growth of a population of an, eco of an ecosystem of an ecology so that is basically what our answer there is that is option D for question 16. So we'll move to question 17 now. Which of the following represents the correct hierarchical organization of life from the smallest to the largest scale? So we have options A, organs, tissues, cells, organisms, populations, community, ecosystem. Option B says cells, organs, tissues, organisms, population, community, system, or ecosystem. Option C says tissues, organs, cells, organisms population communities ecosystem and option d there says cells tissues organs organisms population community and ecosystem now the answer to this question is particularly option d which is talking about cell when we look at uh, the organization of life we have it starting from cell so a group of cells with similar function and structure make up what we refer to as tissues and then we have tissues making up the organs Collection of tissues make up the organs. Collection of organs make up the systems. Collection of systems make up the organism. We have the organism going then to the population. And then from the population, it goes down to the community. Let me put it this way. To community. And then from community, it makes up what we refer to as the ecosystem so that is the correct uh hierarchical system so that is our answer to question 17 which is option d 
D. So we move to question 18 now. Which of the following soil types becomes less fertile due to the intense leaching caused by tropical rains? We have yellow soil, lateral soil, red soil, black soil. The soil that actually undergoes this, where we talk about the fertility of the soil, particularly where leaching takes place, is actually option B, which is the lateral soil. Lateral soil becomes less fertile due to intense leaching which is caused as a result of rainfalls. So leaching is a process, when we talk about leaching, we are talking about the process of the washing away of nutrients in the soil. That is basically what leaching is talking about. Leaching is a process of washing away nutrients in the soil basically by rain basically by rain or by water now this happens majorly in the tropical regions where there is heavy rainfall and it can lead to depletion of nutrients in the soil and that makes the soil less fertile. So, option B is our answer. Option B. And then we we'll move to question 19. Which of the following factors primarily affect the distribution of organisms in an ecosystem? A. Wind speed. B. Soil pH. C. Temperature. And D. Day length. When we look at the factors that can affect organism in an ecosystem or in all the ecosystems, we discover that wind does not really do that for all the organisms. It is also not soil pH, but temperature affects all the habitats as well as all the organisms. So that is the answer to our question there. Temperature basically ranges within which the, the organism thrives. So we have a lower maximum limit and then upper maximum limit for organisms to survive. And when organisms tend to find themselves in an environment that is not friendly, particularly when the environment is colder than expected or hotter than expected, they eventually lose themselves or they, they, they find it difficult to survive in such environment. And so that is why we are picking temperature as the answer to that particular question. Option C. And then we have question 20. Which of the following statements is true regarding cell growth? A. We have cell growth is solely influenced by external factors. B. Cell growth is a continuous process throughout the life of a cell. C. Cell growth involves an increase in the number of organelles within a cell. And D. Cell growth occurs by cell division. There is no way we we'll look at cell growth and not talk about cell division because that is actually the answer to our question there. Cell growth on the goes or caused by cell division. And this is where we have mitosis and meiosis taking place. So the cell undergoes cell division where it carries out replication. So cell growth involves an increase in size and mass and this growth is often accompanied by cell division where the cell divides into multiple cells or daughter cells depending on the kind of division that is taking place. During mitosis and meiosis, it brings about two daughter cells and then the two daughter cells can lead to four daughter cells and it keeps multiplying like that. So cell growth is basically brought about as a result of cell division. That is the answer. There. Cell growth is a continuous process throughout life of an organism. So that is our answer, option D. Option D. So we move to question 21. Now, the term cell was given by A. Robert Hooks, B. Schwann, C. DeBerry, and D. Tatum. The person that actually gave the word cell its name is actually Robert Hooke. And that was a scientist that was able to view, he was the first one that was able to view the cork of an oak tree from his microscope. And so he called all of the, component, the compartments that he, made, that he saw, he called them cell. And that was how we gave, or that was how the name cell stuck. So it was actually named by Robert Hooke. That's option A. And then we have 22. Which of the following statement is true regarding the urinary tubule in the excretory system? A. 
the urinary tubule is responsible for production of urine. B. The urinary tubule regulates the water and electrolyte balance in the body. C. Urinary tubule connects the kidney to the bladder. And D. Urinary tubule is the site of filtration of the blood. When we look at this now, the major answer that we are looking for here is that of option A. Option A is our answer for this particular question because urinary tubule is responsible for production of urine. Urinary tubule is a part of the nephron in the kidney. It is indeed responsible for production of urine. And this is done by it reabsorbing useful substances or metabolites from the filtrate. Useful substances like glucose, like uh, waste products, ions. And then it modifies the filtrate and then it is called urine. So basically that is a function of the urinary tubule. It helps to bring about the production of urine. So option A is our answer to that question. Option A. So we move to question 23 now. Which of the following is an example of abiotic ecological factor? Abiotic here is talking about non-living. Which of the following is an example of a non-living ecological factor? Temperature, competition, predation, symbiosis. Talking about the remaining three here, we find out that it involves the input of organisms. It is organisms that will compete together or during predation, the prey is being hunted by the predator and then symbiosis is actually talking about relationship between organisms so it is actually temperature that is the answer to this question that is the ecological factor that is abiotic in this uh, set of options that we have here that is option a 23 is option a and we move to question 24 which type of reproduction involves diffusion of gametes from two parents a sexual reproduction b asexual reproduction c binary fusion d budding now it is very easy to answer this question sexual reproduction is the answer that we are looking for because sexual reproduction is a type of reproduction that involves two periods we have two types of reproduction we have sexual and asexual reproduction like we have stated here uh, previously we have it here asexual reproduction is a type and then the next one is called the sexual reproduction so sexual reproduction involves two parents and we can see example here fusion of gametes unlike the other so if we look at the asexual reproduction which is the one that involves one parent that is where we have budding binary fusion grafting layering and all of those so other examples other options that we have here like budding binary fusion they are all examples of the asexual reproduction which is from a single parent but sexual reproduction is the answer that you are looking for so that is option a and then we move to question 25 which of the following is, is a characteristic feature of kingdom plantae a presence of chloroplast b ability to perform photosynthesis c lack of cell walls d heterotrophic mode of nutrition now when we look at it plants do not undergo heterotrophic nutrition because they produce or manufacture their food by themselves so they are autotrophs not heterotrophic organisms so we rule out option d and then option c there says that plants lack cell walls no that is absolutely wrong plants possess cell walls it is the component that helps to uh, protect internal structures of the plant so they possess cell wall. actually plants have two membranes they have the cell wall and the cell membrane so those are the uh, components that can be found in the cell wall enclosing all the organelles in the cell and then option b there says ability to perform photosynthesis now this would have been uh, picked as our, as our answer but there is a reason why the plants are able to perform photosynthesis and that is as a result of the presence of chloroplast in the plant so the answer we are looking for here is the presence of chloroplast the major characteristic feature of plant kingdom is that they possess chloroplast so with this chloroplast now they are able to perform photosynthetic activity so that is the answer to question 25 option a and then we have question 26 which of the following best describes 
the concept of trophic levels in a functioning ecosystem. A. The levels of ecological interactions within an ecosystem. B. The levels of energy flow within an ecosystem. C. The levels of nutrient cycling within an ecosystem. D. The levels of biological diversity within an ecosystem. Now, when we look at this now, the answer there is option B, the levels of energy flow within an ecosystem. When we talk about trophic level, we are talking about the manner in which energy is being transferred from one organism to another and from that organism to the next and how the energy keeps moving in that manner. So it is the energy that we are trying to monitor, the energy that we are trying to know how it has uh, flown from one organism to the other that we are actually looking out for here. So trophic level actually determines the levels of energy flow within an ecosystem. So that is the answer to uh, question option B is our answer for question 26. And then we move to question 27. Which of the following statements is true regarding sexual reproduction in organisms? Sexual reproduction is the type of reproduction like we stated earlier on that it involves two parents. So let us see the options. It's A says it involves the fusion of gametes from two parents resulting in offspring with genetic variation. B says it involves the production of offspring through a single parent resulting in genetically identical offspring. C says it is a form of asexual reproduction where offspring are produced without the involvement of gametes. And option D there says it does not involve the formation of gametes or the fusion of reproductive cells. Now the answer is option A, which is actually talking about the fusion of gametes. It said it involves the fusion of gametes from two parents. That is this, the this a uh, very clue that we are looking for. Since we are talking about sexual reproduction, it must involve two parents. If you look at options B, C, and D, we notice that it's talking about single parents. So the answer we are looking for is option A for question 27. Option A. And then question 28 now. Which of the following is not a method of reproduction in animals? A. Asexual reproduction. B. Budding. C. Sexual reproduction. D. Sporulation. Asexual reproduction is seen in some animals where the organisms like earthworms, they are hermaphrodites, they do not actually need other organisms to help them carry or bring about reproduction, so they carry out asexual reproduction. We also have budding in some organisms and then sexual reproduction in some organisms. The only one that cannot be found in animals is the sporulation. Sporulation simply is the production of spores. Basically, that is what sporulation talks about. So, animals do not produce spores and that is why sporulation is not a method of reproduction in animals. So, the answer to question 28 is option D. So, we move to question 29. Which of the following are components of the skeletal system in humans? A. Cartilage and blood vessels. B. Ligaments and tendons. C. Muscles and nerves. D. Bones and joints. When we talk about the skeletal system, we're talking about the rigid framework that is found in organisms. Skeleton or the skeletal system is the rigid framework that gives support protection to the body of an organism. So that is basically what the skeleton or the skeletal system is talking about. So cartilages, yes, cartilages are part of the skeleton, they, they are part of the supporting tissues because cartilages form bones. But blood vessels are not part of the skeletal system. Ligaments and tendons, they are not really part of the skeletal system. The muscles and the nerves, the, the muscles and the nerves are not part of the skeletal system. It is actually the bones and the joints that form this uh, particular answer here. So option D, we have the bones and joints where bones meet. That is the answer to question 29. 
option D, and then we have question 30. Which of the following is an example of conserving resources in an ecosystem? A. Excessive use of chemical fertilizers in agriculture. B. Introducing invasive species to an ecosystem. C. Implementing sustainable fishing practices. And then D. It says cutting down trees for timber production. When we look at all of the options that we have here, we notice that when we excessively use chemical fertilizers in agriculture, the fertilizers get used up. So that is not a system of conservation. Then introducing invasive species to an ecosystem can actually cause the organisms to become extinct. So that is not also uh, a conservative measure. When we look at the fourth option here, cutting down trees for timber production, definitely there is going to be a reduction in the number of the population of the trees in the forest. So that is also not a conservative measure. The answer there is option C, which is implementing sustainable fishing practices. They implement practices that will make sure that there is continuity in fishing practices. So that is basically the answer to question 30, option C. So we move to question 31. Which of the following statements is true regarding sex-linked traits? A. Sex-linked traits are located on the sex chromosomes. B. Sex-linked traits are inherited only from the mother. C. Sex-linked traits are more commonly observed in females. And D. Sex-linked traits are not influenced by the hormonal factors. If you look at this particular question now, sex-linked traits here talks about the ability to be either a male or a female. That is basically what sex-linked traits talks about. So, it is the sex-linked traits that are located on the sex chromosome. We have two major sex chromosomes. In the males, we have the XY chromosomes. Those are the sex chromosomes. And then in the females, we have the XX chromosomes. So those are the sex chromosomes. So it is on these sex chromosomes that we have uh, sex linked traits located. So sex linked traits are located on the sex chromosomes. That is the answer to question 31. Option A. Question 32 now. What is autotrophic nutrition? Nutrition in which organisms obtain food by breaking down complex organic compounds. B. Nutrition in which organisms obtain food from other organisms. C. Nutrition in which organisms obtain food by consuming both plants and animals. And D. Nutrition in which organisms produce their own food using energy from the sun or inorganic substances. Now, option D is our answer. Why are we going to pick option D? Because we have two types of nutrition. Okay. Types of nutrition. We have autotrophic nutrition, which is actually carried out by plants, carried out by grain plants. And that is why they are called the producers. So they manufacture their food by themselves. So there are two processes here. We have the first one to be photosynthesis. Where they actually make use of energy from the sun to manufacture their food. While the other one is called chemosynthesis. Where they make use of inorganic materials. And nutrients in the soil to manufacture their food. So that is autotrophic nutrition. And then the second type, the second type, we have B here to be heterotrophic. Heterotrophic nutrition. This one is carried out by other organisms. So under heterotrophic nutrition, we have so many examples, symbiosis. We have parasitism. We have mutualism, we have uh, commensalism, we have saprophytism, we also have predation. 
in some situations you can also write the composers but though the composers could be part of the saprophytism so these are examples of heterotrophs so the question we actually asked is talking about autotrophs so they are the ones that produce their food from uh sunlight and then inorganic material so that is the answer to our question 32 option d then question 33 now which of the following is a plant hormone responsible for promoting cell elongation and growth we have so many plant hormones abscisic acid gibberellins ethylene cytokinin oxine there are so many of them but the actual answer to our question here the one that is responsible for promoting cell elongation and growth is the gibberellin gibberellins are responsible for actually elongating the cell as well as bringing about growth in the part of the plant that is basically what the gibberellin does other examples we have uh, cytokinin there let's see the function of cytokinin its own function is basically to bring about cell division and then enlargement also it initiates uh shoots that is the function of the cytokinin cell division and enlargement as well as shoot initiation those are the functions of the cytokinin we have ethylene ethylene and its own function is to regulate and stimulate the opening of flowers it regulates and stimulates the opening of flowers we also have other ones like the abscisic acid abscisic acid which is responsible for promoting seed dormancy it promotes seed dormancy we have so many examples we have oxine oxine is majorly responsible for promoting cell growth it promotes cell growth and elongation so we have so many examples like that so for our question here now gibberellin the question is actually talking about cell growth it promotes cell elongation and growth it could have been auxin but since auxin is not in our option the next fit is going to be gibberellin that is answer to question 33 option b so question 34 the membrane around the vacuole is known as the elaoplast the ameloplast the tonoplast and then the cytoplast the answer is the tonoplast option c is the answer to question 34 so we move to question 35 germination is a process in which a seed begins to photosynthesize develop into a mature plant absorb nutrients from the soil break dormancy and starts to grow that is what question 35 is talking about now when we talk about germination it is a process whereby the seed breaks a particular phase where we refer to the dormant phase where the, the seed is not viable where the seed is not productive so the seed breaks through that phase to become fruitful and so it starts to grow so germination is actually talking about a process whereby the seed breaks dormancy and then starts to grow so that is basically the answer to that question here question 35 option d is our answer to question 35 so we'll move to question 36 which of the following is evidence of evolution a homologous structures in different species b similarities in embryonic development c fossils of extinct organisms d all of the above when we look at the evidence of evolution which is actually talking about the differences that are seen between organisms that has taken place over a very lengthy period of time all of the following that has been listed as our options here option a b c are some of the evidences that have actually used that have, we have actually used to prove that 
evolution actually takes place or evolution actually occurs so the answer there is homologous structure in different species it is also similarities in embryonic development it is also fossils of extinct organisms so all of these are answers to the question which is talking about the evidence of evolution so the answer there is option d which is all of the above 36 is option d so we move to question 37 what is the term used to describe the maximum number of individuals of a species that an environment can support indefinitely now this particular question needs to be tackled with care you need to be very very vigilant because there are some hidden keywords in this question here now when we look at this now he said the maximum number of individuals that talks about population but we now need to see something here again it says that an environment can support indefinitely so it is no longer talking about population it is this time around talking about the ability of that environment what does that environment have in 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 form what is the capability of that environment and that is actually what we refer to as the carrying capacity of an environment so the carrying capacity of an environment is the maximum number of organisms that that environment can accommodate at a specific point in time if it passes that particular limit the environment will no longer be able to support them and then competition sets in so the answer to question 37 is the carrying capacity that option c so we move to question 38 which of the following statements is true about the kingdom fungi remember we made mention of the types of kingdom that we have earlier on we said we have five kingdoms kingdom monera kingdom protista kingdom animalia kingdom plantae and kingdom fungi so this question is specifically to the kingdom fungi so we want to see which of these statements is true of the kingdom fungi now the options that we have there option a says fungi obtain nutrients by absorbing organic matter option b says fungi are photosynthetic organisms option c says fungi are multicellular organisms option d says fungi reproduce through the formation of seeds now fungi is not a multicellular organism it is a unicellular organism so option c is automatically ruled out fungi also does not possess chloroplast and since it doesn't have chloroplast there is no way it can photosynthesize so option b is ruled out as well and then option d there says fungi reproduce through the formation of seeds no fungi does not produce seeds so, so that is also ruled out so the answer we are having here left is option a fungi obtain nutrients by absorbing organic matter and that is absolutely correct that is the answer to our question option a so we move to question 39 which of the following statements best describes courtship behaviors in animals a says courtship behaviors are solely performed by males to establish dominance within a social group b says courtship behaviors involve displays and rituals performed by both males and females to attract mates c courtship behaviors are primarily performed by females to attract males for mating and d Courtship behaviors are aggressively, they are aggressive interactions between males competing for a female mate. Now, whenever we talk about courtship, we actually have to understand that two organisms are involved. So it is not option A because option A here is saying that courtship behaviors are solely performed by males. No, it is not performed by males only. It is not performed by females only either. So option A and option C are out of the equation. So we are left with option B and D. D then says courtship behaviors are aggressive interactions between males competing for a female mate. No, this is not the answer. It is not a competition between the males fighting for the female. It is actually a relationship and a behavior that is seen between the male and the female actually showing interest in one another so that is what we refer to as courtship behavior it shows the readiness in the organisms the males and the female that is what we refer to as courtship behavior so option b is our answer option b so we move to question 40 
which on the following represents an example of ecological management and conservation through a biological association. A. Construction of a dam for hydroelectric power. B. Introduction of an invasive species for pest control. C. Clear cutting of a forest for timber extraction. D. Establishment of marine protected areas. Now, looking at this particular question here, since we are talking about ability to carry on or to preserve a particular commodity or to preserve a particular material for future purposes or for future references we have this answer to be uh, option d establishment of marine protected areas when we protect the marines we actually give uh, survival chances to the marine lives so that is the answer it is not construction of dam because when we construct them, definitely the organisms that survive in the dam will no longer be able to survive. And then, introduction of invasive species for pest control will also eradicate some materials in that environment. And cutting of trees also will eradicate the trees or the timber in the uh, forest. So the answer we have there is option D, which is establishment of marine protected areas. Option D is our answer. So we move to question 41 now. Which of the following statement best describes the role of competition in the process of adaptation? A. Competition leads to the selection of individuals with favorable traits for survival and reproduction. B. Competition ensures equal distribution of resources among individuals in a population. C. Population leads to development of new traits and adaptation in a population. And then we have D. Competition reduces the need for adaptations as individuals coexist peacefully now when we look at this particular question here we find out that the answer to question 41 is going to be option a so what 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 is that uh option there it says competition leads to the selection of individuals with favorable traits for survival and reproduction in every environment where there is adaptation particularly when organisms find it difficult to survive in that environment there is going to be what we refer to as competition which will actually take place between organisms in that environment and then we'll find out that there's going to be what we refer to as survival of the fittest where the ones that are more suited to that environment will survive in that environment leaving out the ones that do not have the capability to survive so it brings about selection of individuals with favorable traits for survival and reproduction. That is the answer to question 41, option A. And then question 42. Which of the following processes is involved in the reproduction of developing organisms? A. Budding. B. Germination. C. Fertilization. And D. Pollination. When we look at reproduction, reproduction is actually... The process by which organisms are brought to life now budding is actually the cutting of a bud from a mature organism that is budding in germination we see germination as the break of seed dormancy and then pollination is the transfer of pollen grains from the anther to stigma of plants but fertilization is actually the answer we are looking for here Budding is the cutting of an outgrowth called a bud in a mature in a mature organism. Such is seen in Hydra, it is seen in yeast, it is seen in the rhizoid, like example, we have the ginger. So that is body germination. Is the process of seed breaking Domancy, when it starts to uh, fruit, that is what germination talks about. And then we have the next one to be pollination. 
pollination is the transfer of pollen grains from the anther of a plant to the stigma and we have two types of pollination we have self pollination and cross pollination so fertilization is the union where the male gametes fuses where the nucleus sorry of the male gamet fuses with the nucleus Of the female gametes. So that is what our answer there is for question 42. The answer is option C. And then we move to question 43. Which of the following is a primary source of pollution in aquatic ecosystem? Pollution is actually talking about release of pollutants. So which one is a source of pollution? We're looking at the pollutants now where it is being emanated from so since we are talking about pollution in aquatic ecosystem we are talking about water pollution so which of them is a water pollutant soil erosion industrial discharge air pollution as well as deforestation soil erosion will not necessarily result to aquatic uh, pollution or water pollution Air pollution cannot result to water pollution, and then deforestation also, cutting down or the logging of a forest cannot result to water pollution. But when industrial discharge, waste from industries are being emptied, chemical waste from industries, when they are being emptied into water bodies, it can actually pollute the water body, thereby causing harm to the aquatic life. So that is the answer to question 43 option b so question 44 now the alternate form of a gene is a alternate type b dominant character c recessive character and d allele a gene is made up of two materials for example, we could have something like this as a gene. Now, let me put it here. Capital H and small h. This together is what we refer to as a gene. Now, each of these can be uh, divided. We could split each of these into this. Where we'll be having capital H and small h. So, each of these ones here now is what we refer to as the allele so we have we have two types of alleles we usually have in heterozygous traits we usually have the dominant and the recessive allele so this one here is the dominant it is also always expressed in the gene while the small is recessive it is not usually expressed in the gene so when we talk about gene we are talking about uh, formations of allele. So the alternate form of a gene is the allele. That is the answer to question 44. Option D. And then question 45. In monohybrid inheritance, if an organism carries two different alleles for a particular gene, it is called A. Homologous B. Dominant C. Heterozygous D. Recessive. Like I just told us now, we have two alleles. This one here is referred to this one here is referred to as the dominant while this one here is referred to as the recessive so the question is asking us now that in monohybrid inheritance if an organism carries two different alleles for a particular gene it is called the heterozygous homozygous means that they carry the same allele for that particular gene 
but heterozygous they carry two different alleles so that is heterozygous which is the answer to question 45 option c and so we have question 46 now which of the following is an example of conserving resources in an ecosystem excessive use of chemical fertilizers in agriculture introducing invasive species to an ecosystem implementing sustainable fishing practices cutting down trees for timber production so the answer there is similar to the question we have seen before the answer there is implementing sustainable fishing practices option c option c so question 47 now which gland is responsible for producing the hormone insulin a thyroid gland b pituitary gland c pancreas and d adrenal gland All right. Here we have something called in the middle there we have the one that is called okay let me just put them out first. We have another gland here. We have the two The two shaped kidneys. We have the testes for the female for the males. We have this, and then we have now something similar to this. Now here we have the pituitary In the neck here we have the parathyroid And there are four loops And then in the middle we have the thyroid Here we have the pancreas This one here is called the adrenal. And then we have this one here. It is called the gonad gland. The gonad. And this one is for the females. It is responsible for producing the oestrogen, which commences the oestrogen cycle. And the second one is called the progesterone. And then lastly, we have this one here. It is called the it is also called gonadomon. This time around for the males. It produces the testosterone. So the uh the pancreas, this one here produces the pituitary hormone, parathyroid produces parathyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone, the pancreas produces two hormones. The first one it produces insulin, and then the second one it produces the glucagon. So, those are the two hormones. Insulin is responsible for carrying out conversions, excess glucose converted by insulin. to glycogen and then the second one now that is the function of the glucagon glucagon is now responsible for converting the glycogen back to glucose form so that the body can actually make use of it in fasting states so these are the uh, hormones that are produced in the pancreas so that is the answer to the question that we have there for question 47. So, the gland that is responsible for producing the hormone insulin is the pancreas, which is option C. And then, question 48. 
Viviparity refers to the productive strategy in which offsprings are produced by internal fertilization, offsprings are produced by external fertilization, offsprings develop and are nourished inside the female's body, offsprings develop and are nourished outside the female's body. When we look at this here, yeah, the answer for this question when we talk about viviparity is actually talking about option C, where, where organisms are actually nourished inside the develop and they are nourished inside the female's body and then they are born so with the parity is the ability to give birth to young ones alive we have so many others so viviparity refers to the reproductive strategy in which offsprings develop and are nourished inside the body this system is referred to as internal fertilization and then there's provision of nutrients to the developing embryo within the mother's reproductive system so that is what viviparity talks about so the answer to that question is option c and then 49 what are the primary products of photosynthesis a. Carbon dioxide and water B. Glucose and oxygen C. Glucose and carbon dioxide and D. Oxygen and water When we look at this Product of photosynthesis Photosynthesis is the process by which plants manufacture their food in the presence of sunlight using nutrients in the soil and water in the soil So whenever photosynthesis takes place the products formed are we have formation of glucose and then oxygen the glucose is formed from the starch, the energy that is gotten from the sun, and then oxygen is also generated. It is this oxygen that plants will give to animals, and then animals take in the oxygen, use the oxygen, and then they replenish it with carbon dioxide that is taken in by the plants. So it is a two-way street. So the answer there is option B. Option B, and then we have question 50. Which of the following best describes a natural habitat in ecology? A. An area where organisms naturally live and interact with their surroundings. B. A human-created environment for wildlife conservation. C. A controlled laboratory setting for ecological experiments. And D. A protected area for endangered species. When we talk about habitat, refer to habitat of an organism. Habitat is the natural dwelling place of an organism. So basically that is what we refer to as habitat. So option A here says an area where organisms naturally live and interact with their surroundings. So that is the answer to our question. It is not a place that is created by humans, it is not a laboratory, and it is not a place that is protected uh, for endangered species. It is the A, which is, and the, it is a natural environment that organisms tend to interact with their surroundings. So that is the answer to our question there, option A. So we move to question 51. Which of the following statements best describes pollination in plants? A. Pollination is the process of transferring pollen from the stigma to the anther of a flower. B. Pollination is the process of transferring pollen from the anther to the stigma of a flower. C. Pollination is the process of releasing pollen into the air for dispersal. And D. Pollination is the process of seed formation within a flower. So if we look at what I wrote earlier on, we've talked about pollination here. This is it here. We said pollination is the transfer of pollen grains from the anther of a plant to the stigma of the plant. So that is what pollination is. So we have it here in option B. Pollination is the process of transferring pollen from the anther to the stigma of a plant. That is the answer to question 51. Option B. And then we have question 52 now. Behavioral adaptation for dealing with a hot climate could include A. 
hibernating during the hottest parts of the day b large scales on the back of a lizard c feeding during the hottest part of the day and d a small kidney to conserve water when we look at the options that we have here we will discover that when the environment is hot organisms tend to hibernate that is they tend to shut down major body functions or processes so as to conserve energy and water to be able to return to uh, functional activity when the environment is of better condition so a is the answer to that question there talking about hibernating during the hottest part of the day they just go into a seas let's put it that way where they bring about reduction in body processes so as to prevent water loss to the surrounding and then when the temperature is okay then they come back into action so option a is the answer to question 52 option a question 53 there says the theory of evolution can be defined as a the belief that all species were created by their current form b the hypothesis that organisms strive to improve themselves over generation c the idea that species change over time through natural processes and d the concept that evolution occurs through a series of sudden and dramatic changes when we look at the theory of evolution it helps us to understand that there have been series of changes that have taken place over a very lengthy period of time changes that have taken place in organisms over a very long period of time and that is where the answer to that question lies which is going to be option c the idea that species change over time through natural processes so they change over time over a period of time through natural processes that is the answer to question 53 it is not that species were created in their current form no it is also not that organisms strive to improve themselves for generation over generation and it is not because evolution has occurred through a series of sudden or dramatic changes it is because these changes have taken place over a very long period of time and they are taking place through natural processes so that is option c option c and then question 54 there says which of the following mechanism is responsible for providing support in plants a muscles and bones b exoskeleton c endocrine system and d cell walls and tugor pressure we have talked about supporting tissues in animals this question is for those in plants so it is definitely not muscles and bones it is not the exoskeleton nor is it endocrine system endocrine systems are systems that help in the production of hormones so it is not any of these three here it is the cell walls and the tugor pressure like I said earlier on, plants possess cell wall and it is what gives them rigidity and firmness to their walls. And then, tugor pressure, when the water molecules that run through the vessels in the plant provide turgidity to the cell and its components. So, that is the answer to question 54. Cell wall and tugor pressure. Option D. And then, question 55 now. Metamorphosis is a biological process that involves a the growth and development of an organism from a zygote to an adult b the change in form and structure during the life cycle of certain organism c the regeneration of lost body parts in an organism and d we have the transformation of an organism from an adult stage to a larval stage when we talk about metamorphosis we're actually talking about growth that takes place in some organisms. Now, it is taking place from the smaller level of the organism to a larger or the more developed form of that particular organism. So, it is the changes that takes place in form and structure during the life cycle of certain organisms. That is the answer to our question there. The changes do not take place in zygotes into formation of adult or that it takes place from adult to larval stage. No, it is in the life cycle of the organism. And so that is the answer to your question 55. So when we talk about metamorphosis, basically we have two types of metamorphosis. We have the complete metamorphosis and the incomplete metamorphosis.
It's a biological process. that involves the changes we see in form and structure. During the life cycle of some organisms. So like I said, we have two types. We have number one, we have the complete, the complete metamorphosis. And then we have the, the incomplete metamorphosis. This is an example of what complete metamorphosis looks like. You can see egg turning into caterpillar caterpillar to the pupa the pupa to butterfly so this is an example of complete metamorphosis so we can also have incomplete where it moves from the egg to pupa and then the adult something like that so those are the two types of uh metamorphosis that we have it is the change in form and structure during the life cycle of certain organisms so that is option b so question 56 which of the following plant tissues is responsible for transporting water and nutrients from the roots to the rest of the plant? A. Mesophyll B. Xylem C. Epidermis and D. Phloem So which of them is responsible for transporting water in the plant? So the answer is xylem. Supporting tissues in plants one we have xylem which translocates water and nutrients in the soil to upper parts Of the plant so its own movement is upwards like this and then the second one we have the phloem the phloem translocates food materials produced by the plant to the storage sites so two supporting tissues that we have in the plant so the answer to our question is actually the xylem xylem makes up that part that is responsible for conducting water and nutrients from the roots to the upper part of the plant so that is option b and then we have question 57 which of the following organs is primarily responsible for excretion in humans liver pancreas kidney lungs we have the liver to be responsible for storage of glucose when it is in storage form, which is in the form of glycogen. So liver helps to store glycogen. Pancreas is respons responsible for producing insulin and glucagon. The kidney there is the major answer that we are looking for. It's the primary organ that is responsible for excretion because it helps to excrete metabolites and waste materials in form of urine. Urine is being formed and then it houses or it accommodates so many amount of water, so much amount of water and then unwanted materials in the body. So they are being diluted in the water and sent out of the body in form of urine. And then lungs is just for majorly gaseous exchange. So the primary organ that is responsible for our excretion is the kidney. That is option C. And then question 58. Which of the following best describes physiological variation in biology? A. Variations in the physiological process and functions of organism. B. Differences in physical characteristics and appearance within a population. C. Differences in behavior and social interactions among individuals. And then D. Variations in the genetic makeup of individuals within a species. 
when we look at that we find out that our answer is option a what is option a, a, a telling us it says variation is found in the physiological process and function of the body when we talk about physiological variation we're talking about variation that is seen in organism particularly making up the body part or the internal structure of that organism that is what physical variation is talking about we have other types of variation like we have structural variation and we have uh, morphological variation okay, but this one i'm talking about is talking about the physiological variation so option a is our answer option a and then question 59 which of the following is a male reproductive organ in humans a uterus b ovary c testis d fallopian tube the answer is testis the uterus is also known as the womb uterus also known as the womb is a part of the female reproductive system that accommodates the developing embryo so that is the uterus and then we have the ovary the ovary is responsible for the production of mature egg cells and then we have the last one called the fallopian tube or the oviduct that is another name for the fallopian tube is the part where the mature egg cell lies in wait for the mature sperm cell for fertilization so that is the pain of the uterus the ovary and the fallopian tube so the only option that we have there that is for the male is actually the testis the testis is the organ that is responsible for sperm production in the males and it is found in the scrotum of the male reproductive system so that is option c and then we have question 60 which of the following describes the inheritance of traits from parents to offspring evolution adaptation genetics and then natural selection the transfer of traits from parent to offspring is basically talking about genetics it is not evolution it is not adaptation and it is not natural selection it is genetics Gen genetics is the study of genes transferred from parents to offspring so that is basically what genetics talks about so that is the answer to question 60 option c when we look at the other option evolution is talking about series of changes that have taken place in organisms over a long period of time adaptation is the ability of organisms to actually survive in an environment the, the natural selection talks about the features that organisms have processed that has made it possible for them to survive during competition so the answer to our question there for question 60 is actually from c which is genetics so we'll move to question 61 which of the following is a characteristic of cells related to irritability ability to respond to stimuli ability to synthesize for uh, proteins ability to generate energy ability to replicate dna when we talk about irritability it's simply talking about stimuli so it is the ability to respond to stimuli not 
photosynthesizing or synthesizing proteins or generation of energy or is it to replicate DNA? It is just basically to respond to stimuli. That is what irritability does. So that is option A for question 61. And then question 62. What is the tissue responsible for transporting water and minerals from the roots to the rest of the plant? We have said that earlier on. That is xylem, which is option A. And then question 63. Which of the following blood vessels carries oxygenated blood away from the heart? A. Arteries. B. Venous. C. Capillaries. And D. Veins. For this, I will need to explain circulation. So when we talk about circulation, we have basically two types of circulation. We have the pulmonary circulation and the systemic circulation. But let me just depict everything I want to talk about using this. Let's imagine that we have a particular uh, organ here, which is the lungs. And here we have the heart. And other organs of the body, let's make mention of a few. We have the kidney, we have the liver, we have the intestine, we have gallbladder, gallbladder, and so many others. So we now want to look at relationship between all of this. Now, whenever we see cells taking blood away from the heart, when it is taking blood away from the heart, it is always an artery. Artery takes blood away from the heart. Now, the one that takes blood back to the heart is usually called the vein. So arteries take blood away from the heart to organs of the body and then vein returns blood back to the heart. So this one here also, we have the blood going from this place to this one here to be artery. And the one that comes from this one here back to the heart is also called vein. Now, this particular one here, this one here, Blood coming from the heart to other organs of the body carries oxygenated blood. It carries oxygenated blood. So these arteries that feed other organs of the body, excluding the lungs, they all carry oxygenated blood. While the ones that are taking blood back to the heart from other organs of the body, they carry deoxygenated blood. Now, Going to the lungs and the heart, the one that carries blood away from the heart to the lungs is an artery, but this time around it is carrying deoxygenated blood because it is taking the blood to the lungs so that the blood can eliminate or remove the, the carbon dioxide that is in the blood. So the blood now is removed or is devoid of the carbon dioxide and then the lungs replaces the carbon dioxide with fresh oxygen and then it sends the oxygen to the heart in the blood using the veins this time around the vein carries oxygenated blood it carries oxygenated blood through the veins back to the heart so here the system between the heart and organs of the body is what we refer to as the systemic, the systemic circulation. Well, the, the one that encompasses the lungs and the heart only, it cuts across the lungs and the heart, is what we refer to as the pulmonary pulmonary circulation so that is it so organs that carry blood away from the heart they are called arteries so this question now is asking us which of the following blood vessels carries oxygenated blood away from the heart 
so it is the artery that is option a 64 now which of the following is an evolutionary trend commonly observed in organisms a decreased complexity over time b increased dependency on external resources c increased genetic diversity within a within population d decreased adaptation to the environment when we look at this particular question now we get to understand that the answer there is increased genetic diversity within population why this is so because diversity arises through several mechanisms mechanisms such as the genetic mutation recombination of genes and other processes contributing to the adaptability and the survival of population over time so basically that is what results to the evolutionary trend that is observed in organisms so the answer there is option c and then question 65 which of the following is an example of a behavioral adaptation for survival in animals sharp teeth migration wings camouflage sharp teeth is what we refer to as adaptation for feeding wings yeah adaptation for movement and then camouflage yes adaptation for defense or sometimes for concealage so it helps to protect themselves so the answer to this question here when talks about the behavior of organisms the sharp teeth here is structural adaptation wings is also structural adaptation where camouflage is physiological adaptation but when we look at the behavioral the behavior of organisms particularly when they are tending to uh, find themselves in an environment that is not favorable they tend to migrate out of that place so migration is the answer is the behavioral adaptation for survival when the environment is no longer friendly or suitable they need to leave that environment and so that is what we refer to as the behavioral adaptation for survival in animals option b and so question 66 which of the following is an example of a microorganism in action as a disease vector a fungi decomposing dead plant materials b mosquito transmitting malaria c bacteria causing food poisoning and d algae producing oxygen through photosynthesis all other options excluding option b are wrong the answer is option b mosquito is a vector that transmits malaria malaria is the disease that is caused by the action of mosquito the mosquito transmits a particular parasite called the plasmodium when it deposits the plasmodium in the human body that is what results to malaria but the mosquito on its own acts as a microorganism by biting and feasting on animals so we see mosquito as a microorganism in action as well as it being a disease vector so that is the answer to question 66 option b question 67 which component of blood is responsible for carrying oxygen to the body tissues a platelets b white blood cell c red blood cell and d plasma the blood components now blood components we have one we have the rbc the rbc is also called the erythrocytes it is a major function of the erythrocytes to actually carry oxygen across the body why because it contains a particular substance called the hemoglobin hemoglobin so hemoglobin binds to oxygen to give us what we refer to as oxy hemoglobin so that is the answer to our question but let us see functions of other blood sub, uh, corpus, corpuses or components we have the wbc the wbc is also called the leukocytes now the leukocytes is divided into two we have the phagocytes we have the phagocytes and then we have the lymphocytes these two their function primarily is to defend the body against invaders and we have the third one to be the blood platelets blood platelets or the thrombocytes 
The thrombocytes helps to clot blood. It clots the blood. And then we have the liquid, the only liquid corpus that we have in the blood. The liquid corpus will be the plasma. That is the liquid component of the blood. So the one that is responsible for actually carrying oxygen is the RBC, the red blood cell, because of its possession of the hemoglobin. So that is the answer to our question there, the red blood cell option C. So question 68. Which of the following is an example of physiological variation in organism? Variation in blood pressure among individuals. Variation in big shape among finches. Differences in fur color in rabbit. Variation in leaf shape in plants. All of the others that we have in B, C, D, they are not physiological variation but structural variation the only physiological variation that we have there is the variation that is found in blood pressure among individuals it is internal structure of the body of the organism so that is option a option a and then we have question 69 what is the primary source of variation in population a gene flow b mutation c natural selection and d genetic drift. the primary source of variation in population is mutation mutation is what results when there is a change genetic change in when there is a change in the gene or genetic makeup of the structure of an organism so that is mutation and that is the answer to our uh, question 69 option b and then question 70 which of the following traits is not visible in a person with down syndrome a short neck b high muscle tone c small stature and d slant eye the answer there is high muscle tone people who have down syndrome do not necessarily have the high muscle tone they have low muscle tone we can see short neck small stature and slant eyes in people who have down syndrome but not high muscle tone what they have is low muscle tone so that is the answer to our question option b so that brings us to the end of our jam 2023 biology question and answer i will implore you to try as much as possible to go through all that has been said and that has been discussed try to understand them and perhaps you have any question don't hesitate to drop them in our comment section we would love to hear from you, so make do with all that has been provided and made available to you. If you are yet to subscribe to our channel, please kindly do so. And don't forget to click on the notification button when you subscribe so you will be notified subsequently when we upload new content. Like our content, share them with your friends, try as much as possible to help them with, with the content that you have been made to understand. So try to pass it across to them, share with them, let them also gain and benefit from what you have actually learned we would love to hear from you so please try as much as possible to do all that has been said i wish you success in your exams best of luck and bye for now